Coming up next, the bookening finally gets into the meat and gristle of war and peace. Hey everybody, welcome to The Booking. My name is Nathan Albertson, your humble and obedient host. That's right, we're going to get into the meat and into the gristle. I now feel self-conscious, like maybe that's not a saying, maybe that's not a thing. Maybe I've the, never heard that Like before. we're going to get into the gristle of something. <laughs> and you get into the meat of it. Maybe I made that up. You, you want to cut out the gristle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, n- nobody likes the gristle. All right, we're Last not going to- episode was the gristle. Yeah, This yeah. is the meat. No, this is the meat. Feed We've the got, gristle to your dog. Yeah. Feed the yeah. gristle to your dog. So let your dog listen to the last episode. Right. Listen to this episode. <laughs> now, the last episode's fine, but is this it? episode is like the episode that I've been waiting for personally, because we're just going to get into it. We're going to talk about Pierre. We're going to talk about Natasha. We're going nice. to talk about Boris. We're going to talk about all those characters. Boris? And what about him? We're going to talk about Boris? Yeah, we'll probably talk about Boris, old Boris Drabetsky. We'll talk about Natasha. We'll talk about it all, folks. We are going to- You say Drabetsky? What do you say? You say Drobetsky. I say Drobetskoy. D- Drobetskoy. You say Drobetskoy. Boris Drobetskoy. <laughs> Drobetskoy. Drobetsky. I don't know. I just say them phonetically. I'm uh, a, let's call the whole thing off. Yeah, let's call the whole thing off. I'm an Englishman, Brandon. <clears throat> okay. It's good to be an Englishman in 2020. Listen, guys, war and peace, more like war and peeps, because I do it with two of my favorite peeps. Oh, okay. <laughs> Brandon, because <laughs> we're eating the nasty Easter yeah, candy. because we just eat these peeps constantly while we <laughs> yeah, podcast. Yeah, we do also. People should know <laughs> we are hopped up on Easter peeps. That's how we get our energy. That is how we get our energy, and we're all going to die by the age of 37. We each eat five boxes by ourselves each episode. Right. And we're talking about cardboard, everything. We just yeah. we chow all the boxes, it down. yep. Listen, boxes, more like foxes. As in Brandon's wife thinks he's a fox. Whoa. <laughs> and, and I should introduce him. You should. His name is Brandon Chastine. He's hey. the scholar who's a baller of reading. Nathan, it's good to be here. Thanks, Brandon. We're talking um, about one of your favorite books today. We are. And did I tell people I'm Nathan Albertson, humble and obedient host? I don't believe you did. And Leo Tolstoy, more like, oh boy, we get to talk to Jake Menzel, Pastor Jake Menzel, the pastor who's a master of Reading. That was very smooth. <laughs> How long did you spend on that one? <laughs> Jake, I was writing all morning. <laughs> Jake's the pastor who's a master of reading. True That's or false? Funny. True. Brandon is the scholar who's a baller of reading. I'm your humble and obedient host. I also like to read and I think have some claim of being something of a person who's an acceptable podcaster upon the subject of reading. And you are able to read, Nathan. Yes, I can read. Listen, let's get into it. Let's not waste any more time. Let's talk about war and peace. Where do we start? Brandon, why don't you choose a character for us to talk about? Choose a character for us to talk about. Who's your favorite character, Brandon? My favorite character. Whew, man, Nathan, you couldn't have asked a more difficult question to answer. Mm. Way to go. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do. I think when I first read this book, my favorite character was Prince Andre. Mm-hmm. What was it that appealed to you about Andre? Ah. Uh, well, first and foremost, Nathan, <laughs> was yes, what we've Brandon. talked a lot about with Tolstoy is just the rich complexity of each of the characters and how real they felt. And so there was a lot to sympathize with Andre, his disappointment in life, but then also his, the uh, ways Tolstoy matures him and brings him around to mm-hmm. eventually possibly not have disappointment in life, only to give him that strange ending that he gets. Mm-hmm. I liked Prince Andre. I felt like he was... A character that I could enjoy hanging out. Yeah. I guess. Because you're completely contemptuous towards your wife. Yeah, that's right. And disappointed that you married her. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and just kind of mad about life all the time. Yeah, yeah. And sneering and... Yeah, maybe it wasn't because he would be fun to hang out with. <laughs> uh, maybe for a young man, it's actually because with Prince Andre, you feel like there's something to aspire to as well. That he has some character qualities that you would possibly want 
even though he is contemptuous and immature towards the beginning of the novel, Mm -hmm. he at least has some singularity of purpose, some very manly qualities. Certainly if you compare him to Pierre and Nikolai, he's the one that has the the most of a handle handle on his life. He is. And so I think he's the guy who actually does charge into battle and doesn't talk about it afterwards. That's right. He's the guy who grabs the flag and has some real valor on the battlefield. He's the guy who meets Napoleon and nobody ever knows that he met Napoleon. Yep. Because he's not going to tell him. He's not going to talk about it. Yeah. Right. It's not, that's not the thing for him. And so I think that those are the main reasons that he appealed to me so much as a young guy. Mm -hmm. And now there's so many rich characters. I found myself sympathizing with characters I didn't like. I never really did sympathize much with Nikolai, mm-hmm. but I really liked Nikolai this read, and um, especially in the epilogue, yeah, the way he turns out. That's a fun chapter about um, him and Maria's marriage. And Pierre, I think I didn't like Pierre as much as a young man because I was more like Pierre than I was Andre, mm-hmm. to be honest. Then you wanted to admit to yourself. Yeah. And so you, at that age, you want to try and pretend like you're the person you're not. And so if you're more like Pierre, you definitely don't want to admit that you're a Pierre. Right. Because who wants to be Pierre? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> That's the answer. He walked into the room fatly and awkwardly. Yeah. <laughs> so. No one was happy to see him. <laughs> yeah. Everyone frowned a collective frown of disapproval. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Pierre said something stupid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's like the whole, whole first half of the book the, with The Pierre. whole room groaned in disbelief <laughs> and oh, stupidity. <laughs> Well, Pierre's interesting. Meanwhile, Be- Pierre was oblivious and thought that everyone liked him because he- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had a hard time. I, I don't want to say I had a hard, hard time understanding Andre, but he felt like a very real character in a way that a lot of characters, even in Tolstoy, don't. He didn't feel like a type to me. Mm-hmm. Like he couldn't just say he's the he's the this and the this. He's the cold imperious. He's the. I mean, you could say we can come up with adjectives, obviously, but he doesn't fit neatly i'm not sure what actor i would have play him i could see him going any number of different directions wonder what actors have been chosen to play him well in the stupid bbc thing that i started to watch he was just a very handsome young man actually they all were it was just a bunch of sex pot british stars they really that thing was just pretty lame but that's who they chose yeah that guy that's a bad choice and we know that guy from somewhere choice yeah that's not Prince Andre. Yeah, that guy looks like Prince, more like Prince Charming. He looks more like an Anatole than he does. Yeah, yeah he looks exactly like an Anatole. That's a good poll. And Andre is supposed to be s- s- kind of shorter and dark, mm-hmm. right? Is that how he's described? Andre has to be brooding. You know who would actually make a pretty good Andre, I think? Maybe, maybe you guys will scoff at this, but I think Ryan Gosling could do a good... Uh, he's a little bit of a pretty boy, I know, but like Ryan Gosling in, in his tough guy mode... I really don't like all this casting of all these sexy people. Yeah. Instead, they should cast Ryan Gosling. Yeah, they need to cast Ryan Gosling. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's not sexy. You know who would make a good Natasha is Nicki Minaj. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they keep going. Who would make a good Pierre? Wow. <laughs> good Pierre. <laughs> oh, what, uh, what's what's Magic Mike's name? Magic yeah. Mike would make a good Pierre. Yeah. <laughs> Taylor Lautner. No, that's what is Magic? Ch- Channing Tatum. Channing Tatum. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Perfect Pierre. A little bit fat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> More like Channing Tate. Yum. Whoa. So it was what the ladies would say. Okay. Who is Andre, guys? <laughs> How would you sum up this character? I think Andre, I mean, if you're going to fit him into a type, he's kind of a Darcy type mm-hmm. to an extent. You have some real Darcy going on with Andre in the same way that you have some, like, I don't know that I've read a book that I felt might have inspired Pride and Prejudice mm-hmm. or been in Austin's mind. But even, even you know, you saying, you know, you can boil other characters down to types. Well, my mind immediately went to Natasha and Natasha's like, well, what if Elizabeth were also Lydia mm-hmm. at the same time? Yeah. I I agree with, you know, Andre is, he's just more complex. Well, and you have a book of however many pages you get to show more complexity. But I do, I, my mind when I went to casting was like, well, who plays Darcy? And who did we say we wanted to play Darcy and... So young Alan Rickman should yeah, play? Yeah, Alan Rickman, yes. <laughs> young Alan Rickman should just play any role he wants, I think. But He's pretty great. He'd be pretty great. He could play an Andre. Yeah, he could pull that off. Yeah. He's a guy that, you know, he's he's very bright and self-serious and yeah. has great admiration for Napoleon and he's oppressed by his father and he wants to go and do great things. And then he gets out on the battlefield and finds he has the courage to do great things. And then, 
you know, lies there under the blue sky and realizes this is all pretty messed up and stupid. And I don't know what's great about all of this or mm -hmm. what's great about Napoleon even. Like, what what the heck? Right. And I, then... I just don't get it. I don't understand. He's also going to find that he's very useful in politics, that people like him because of his natural talent to lead and... People want to use him. He resents them for it. He finds it easy to slip into that mode, but also mm -hmm. he would much rather just yeah. be out on his own and then... You know, there's a little class privilege in him too. Absolutely. And then there's a beautiful young lady that reminds him that life in and of itself is beautiful and worth living. I love that section where he drives past the old, the, trees. the old yeah. gnarled tree and thinks that's his life. And then he meets Natasha and he drives back and the tree is blooming. <laughs> yeah. It's the, yeah. It's one of the greatest metaphors that he has. And right. It's one of Tolstoy's yeah. great metaphors. And I love that Tolstoy is not ashamed of He's like, it's the obvious. metaphor here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he just well, he leans into it. does the exact same thing in Anna Karenina with the horse. Or yeah. One of my favorite parts of this book is with Pierre and the comet. Right. Yeah. He comes out and he's in bringing into new life or whatever it is. At the end of that, and here, can I see her? Yeah. On the contrary, Pierre, his eyes wet with tears, gazed joyfully at this bright star, which having flown with inexpressible speed through immeasurable space on its parabolic course, suddenly... Like an arrow piercing the earth seemed to have struck here its one chosen spot in the black sky and stopped its tail raised energetically, its white light shining and playing among the countless other shimmering stars. It seemed to Pierre that this star answered fully to what was in his softened and encouraged soul now blossoming into new life. <laughs> That's pretty beautiful. It's so amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's great about that, what Tolstoy does, and I'm trying to think of what other authors actually do this, Tolstoy perhaps uniquely among authors, is a bold statement. We'll see if it holds up. He gets how much people self-mythologize yeah, and how exactly. much they create their own metaphors. So it's not that the author is telling you about the comment. It's that Pierre is actually saying, this comment is a metaphor for my life. Yeah. yeah, and then you get to see some of the silliness and absurdity of how that plays out. Right, we actually stand outside and say, eh, you're not that's that also important, just a comment. Yeah. Sometimes a comment is just a comment, dude. You're not that big of a deal. <laughs> Numerology, right? Oh, you're the one who's chosen to kill Napoleon. Uh huh. <laughs> but people do that sort of thing all the time. Yes. Right. I don't know how many times, you know, that exact thing that happened to Andre, you know, you do that for yourself. Like you go somewhere in the fall, you come back in spring. Not exact thing, but the, you know. Or you see some slight change to something and it just so happens to mirror what's happening in your life. Yeah. You know? Well, you, and having you, just... You happen to... It happens to be spring and you see... Or when, whenever and you see a butterfly. Right. Yeah. You know, and you think, ah, metamorphosis, just like me. Yeah. Well, and it, having just gone through the whole mating ritual thing over the last couple of years... Ah, uh, yes. I was constantly looking for signs and symbols. And I was sort of laughing at myself as I did it. But, you know, you do the thing which Tolstoy has his characters do, which I don't know who else in literature has captured this, where you say, okay, if if a car goes by right now, then it means she's going to call me back. He loves me, he loves me not. Yeah. And then she, she calls you back. Me, she and, loves me not. Yeah. Or if she doesn't, and then if she doesn't call you back, you think, yeah. ah, well, cars don't really mean anything. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if she does, then you're like, hey. yay. <laughs> you're looking for that thing to hang your hat on. Right? right. And you're like, I just had a good date. Wow. I've never noticed how beautiful that tree is. Yeah. That's a symbol for what's happening. You actually well, look for signs and symbols. What's great about it is. Like he goes, so usually you do that sort of thing because you lack the confidence to tell yourself that this is actually something that's probably going to happen. Right. And so it's a way that you can confirm to yourself. Right. And so like, it's usually the thing, you know, that this thing's going to happen because you're pretty also certain that this other thing's going to happen. And so it's just a way to appease your silly, anxious mind. Right. Just to yep. spend a little time. It's good. I'll both Andre and Pierre do it. Mm -hmm. And I think Andre, even when he does it, it's like, what, what am I doing? <laughs> yeah. It's exactly the thought process that I'm sure we've all had of, I know this is silly, but yeah. I'm just going to do it anyway. And Tolstoy gives some dignity to it. He's not just mocking it. I mean, he ma he manages to put us into Pierre's ecstasy over the comment there and make it as beautiful for us as it is for Pierre Yeah. without ever quite not maintaining a little bit of ironic distance on Pierre. He can also let us enter into what the characters are feeling. I mean, the best example in the novel is probably Tolstoy has got maybe a cynical point of view on everything with Sonya, but he lets us feel how lush and beautiful she is to to Nikolai in that moment. Like we just enter yeah. into it. We don't have, we don't stand outside of it and mock it. Yeah. Yep. So what else is there to say about Prince Andre? Part of the He dies. He does die. He does die. And as so some of the parts that didn't strike so the epilogue 
as a teenager, for whatever reason, never really moved me as much as it has now, mm-hmm. which will be interesting to try and figure out why. I mean, I know, I think I know why. Right. His age makes that part mm-hmm. feel more realistic to me. You read it when you were you, a teenager, right? So you didn't have, I should have, you hadn't started a family yet. That yeah, all but about still, you, you think I would have sympathized some with Nicholas Inca, mm-hmm. but never really did. The, I mean, this time it made me cry, that ending. Right. Where he's thinking about Pierre. Anyways, yeah, I was just thinking about how obvious it is that they're the Decemberists. But right. what was I saying? Uh, oh, the part where Andre dies. Mm-hmm. It always felt to me a little strange that this is how Andre ends up. He ends up becoming very cold and distant in his death. Mm-hmm. That always seemed to me a little dramatically like Tolstoy wasn't giving me what I really needed. Yeah, as well, far if as he, Andre's he's death. been cold and distant and he's always been cautious and he lost Natasha out of some kind of misplaced yeah. distance, some literal distance but, plus emotional distance. What I liked about it this time is I don't think Tolstoy felt the need to absolutely 100% redeem Andre at the end. Did you guys feel like he came to a a good end? I mean, how did you guys actually read his I think he was close to a good end, but I actually think that Tolstoy kind of lets the wind out of the bag on purpose. Hmm. I I felt deflated by him just withdrawing from life, entering into this sort of cosmic, oh, well, none of it really matters. Wanted you to think it was a good end? Well, that's a fantastic question. I think so, because Pierre achieves a kind of cosmic Zen. transcendence through suffering that's similar. Yeah, it almost feels like, you know, Tolstoy's view of death is... Wrong. Well, yeah. It, yeah. You know, what it, Andre's been on his own hero's journey, and now he's he's got to go to the Grey Havens because he can never live in the Shire. You know, he's been someplace in his mind and in his heart that it it transcends this earthly existence Mm -hmm. and needs to pass on Hmm. and is going to let go of his life, even though he doesn't have to. That's what it felt like. And I was just like, well, there's something beautifully existential and also kind of garbage, kind of suicidal about that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, One day we'll read Death of Ivan Ilyich and we'll be able to compare it to Tolstoy's ultimate portrait of death, which will be interesting. But you're going to say, sorry. I don't remember what I was saying. Usually it's certainly not something. Uh, It's certainly not satisfying as a reader. No, what you kind of want, I mean, if you're just tidying things up and giving people the endings that you feel like you want and they deserve, what I want is for Tolstoy to, or for Tolstoy, for, I want Prince Andre to really reconnect with Natasha in a very real yeah. way for, for there to be a lot of warmth. Lesser. Yeah. The fact that he's kind of withdraws and that Natasha and... But there is a, that realism to it. And you, you see this kind of thing, the real, that withdrawing does seem to work both ways in situations where people know they're dying Mm -hmm. at the very least where people joe bailey and the view from a hearse talks about this how that you can see and it feel this happens all the time in hospital rooms where you know first goodbye is a kiss and then it's a kiss on the cheek and then it's a touch and then it's a wave at the door and it's people emotionally emotionally distancing themselves from the pain they're about to face Mm -hmm. before they have to face it and causing suffering on both parts right and uh the dying often do that too they don't want to say they don't want to actually face the reality that they're dying they don't want to say their goodbyes they don't want to just sort of coldly reject it all Mm -hmm. and don't face up to what's Right. What's happening and do the emotional work of having relational closure with people. Right. Yeah, that's what I guess it's lacking or or feels at least dramatically like you're not getting the thing that you just expect and kind of desire, which is closure at the end of the day. And it like, is by comparison's sake, you get to see his dad do the opposite. Yeah, that's that a really moving great. moment. His dad gets to just say, Maria, I'm sorry. I've been a terrible. I've been a terrible father. Father, I love you. And yeah, that is interesting. You're you so that part makes you cry, but you almost resent it. Like, oh, great, dude, you you you, get you to got wash to away just wipe this. away <laughs> a, a life of abusing this poor girl with a couple words. But I think Tolstoy's being a realist in both cases, isn't yeah, he? I think, yeah, some people die well. Some people through. live crappily and die well. Some people live wellish, and wellish, and die crappily. Yeah, it's not that Andre dies. It's poorly. not the worst death. No, no. It's just it's anticlimactic. Yeah, there's right, no, yeah. you were, there's very little sentiment to it. Because you were hoping, I th- yeah, you're right. You were hoping that Tolstoy would give us a big cinematic scene right. of, of Andre dying, and he doesn't. It would be fascinating and to not watch. Not a cinematic scene, a at least an emotionally cathartic yeah. ramp up to that moment. And right. He doesn't do it for you. And here's a character you've spent 800 pages 
not right. hundred pages with. It just dies. His death almost feels as unceremonious as the guy, Pierre's mystic friend that gets shot behind the tree with the dogs as, yeah. as, as Pierre walks away from him. You must feel in both cases, like we as an author, as a reader, we're just going to withdraw and let this person die. And it happens a little bit with Petia too. Well, Petia is great. I love Petia's death. I mean, yeah. it's, it's brutal. It's sad, but it's. Because it comes out of nowhere. It just, that just feels like a classic war is hell kind of, here's what happens. You think it's glorious, but sometimes people just die and there's nothing pretty about it. The bullet hits the head of the young boy and he's gone. Yep. He's just gone. Well, that is one of the best things about the book as a whole is that life never stops. Everybody dies. Right. That's not the point. And so life go, keeps go, moving on for everybody. And they we get glimpses and snapshots of them grieving in their own way. But, you know, it's, he's not going to be melodramatic about right. it. He's not going to be Dickensian. He's just... He's a realist through and through. Well, and he just doesn't feel like he's striving for dramatic arcs. I mean, I'm sure I'm not the first person to say this book could have ended 500 pages before it did. It could have gone another 1,000 pages. feels like it's just like, here's some more of the stuff that happened. Yeah. Because it obviously happened. Did Tolstoy have a design in mind with the contrast of Andre and Pierre? Are they supposed to be in conversation with each other? I mean, yeah, that's the... Obvious answer. That's the nature of art. <laughs> yeah. They're supposed to just like Levin. I don't know. Tolstoy is such a realist. I could see him just being like, well, these are the two guys. Like, Yeah. You're supposed to compare them, but I don't know if they're supposed to be exact like parallels to one another in the sense that everything that on, that they're, they're not foils necessarily. Right. Yeah. They're friends and he, he wants to follow t- the lives of these two men. Obviously, there's supposed to be some parallels because they're both suitors of Natasha. Right. And so at some point they were both suitable to be her husband. Are you supposed to think that Andre was actually an acceptable match with her? Or was that just... I don't know, because you have the the stuff with Countess Rustoff, where she always seems like there's something off. And other people think that there's something a little bit off with this relationship between Andre and Natasha. Mm -hmm. And this time I was trying to figure out, does Tolstoy agree with the Countess? Right. I kind of think maybe he does a little bit. I mean, he never really comes out and shows you his hand. He's very good at not doing that. Well, he does really want you to be cheering for Andre and Natasha, though. Team Natasha, Natandre. Natandre. Yeah. Hashtag Natandre. Yeah. Well, I think, especially because you love Andre, you just want something good to happen to him. And you feel that slipping out of his grasp. And you're like, dude, come back from Europe. Get this. Yeah. Get this figured out. Yeah. What was the question? I have no idea. Uh, do Pierre and Andre stand in contrast to each other? Or they stand in contrast to one another. Somehow we got onto this relationship. Oh, is, yeah, just is Andre a good suitor for Is he a good Natasha? suitor for Natasha? Well, you, you brought in and said, well, obviously they're meant to because yeah, they're because both they suitors both. of Natasha. So that's right. how we. Yeah, that's how we got here. I mean, he's older than she is. Mm-hmm. But you don't get the sense just that. Pierre. Yeah, you don't get the sense that Tolstoy thinks that they're necessarily a bad for one another. Right. I don't but, know that he would even really think of it in those terms. I don't know. I don't think you would either, but... This is the thing that could have happened, and we would I think there was just a sense of... And I think with Countess Rostov, it was more a sense of the dread of Andre leaving Mm -hmm. and what was going to happen with him leaving. She knew that Natasha was not mature enough yet to deal with that, and it turned out that Mama knows best. Sure. Because she wasn't. She was not. (laughs) Andre is more of the man who's practical Mm -hmm. and sees life not nearly as poetically as Pierre does, right? Pierre is much more driven by his big ideas, and his big ideas and his feelings about things. Mm-hmm. While Andre is driven much more about just the practicalities of his existence. Yeah, And so, yeah, it makes sense that the one would eventually <clears throat> become a man that everybody could rely on to get legal matters and things like that done. And the other would become a man who would be the, the dreamer who would try to start new revolutions. Right. So in that sense, yeah, I do think that they're in contrast to one another. Both um, ends lead to death, I guess. Both ends do lead to death. And I'm not positive which Tolstoy envies or would recommend as the better man. That's interesting. I don't think he has a lot of sympathy for Pierre the dreamer. I don't either. Mm-hmm. I don't think he cares that Pierre is, you know, all of Pierre's philosophies go nowhere. And eventually one of his philosophy, his little philosophies is going to get him killed. Yeah, I get, I get the sense that Tolstoy really respects Andre because... It's one of those cases where the author wishes he was more that person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it, it's pretty much accepted fact that Pierre and Levin are both pictures and bio, um, little snippets of Tolstoy. Right. 
And there's a lot of Levin and Pierre, but they're still very different characters. But still, oh, yeah. there's supposed to be aspects of one, of Tolstoy. And Tolstoy, I mean, to the fact that Pierre was fat even. Mm-hmm. I said that Tolstoy meant fat, a lot of people think. And um, Andre is not Tolstoy. I mean, you can't imagine Andre ever writing War and Peace. No, he wouldn't right. have the patience Mm-mm. for it. But to- Pierre, on the other hand, you can imagine Pierre okay. deciding yeah. to sit down and write War and Peace. Yep. But Andre never would. And so... I do think that what I, I picked up, and I think I picked up on in other readings too, is that there is this, not even envy of, just admiration of Andre mm-hmm. with Tolstoy that he doesn't have for Pierre. And I think it's just that inevitable, like, unless it's a narcissist that's writing, the author is going to naturally feel that way towards the characters who are more like him. Mm-hmm. And I say that because I do think that Dickens kind of does admire David Copperfield. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but... That's different. Well, how does Tolstoy <laughs> feel about Pierre? For me, that's kind of the hundred dollar or the hundred dollar million dollar question because it seems like he. I don't know. Does he despise him? I don't think he despises him. It feels that way early on, or it felt that way early on. I to think me. it. I think early on he does. I think early on he does not respect Pierre. Mm-hmm. Felt like a whole lot of if Pierre's a stand in for Tolstoy, it felt like a whole lot of self loathing went into. Yeah, but even like the stuff that's happening, Anna shares. You also get the sense that he doesn't like the fact that Pierre, the reason that Pierre is not wanted there is because Pierre is going to break. Social convention. The social convention. I don't Mm -hmm. think he has any more respect for the soiree gathering than he does Pierre. Sure. And so in that sense, I think he actually probably saw Pierre as good medicine for that. Right. Sort of. They deserve him kind of thing. They they deserve him and he deserves them. Mm -hmm. Um, By the end of the book, I think that Tolstoy tolerates Pierre. Yeah. I mean, the fact that he lets him marry Natasha, who he obviously is very fond of. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Well, he's got to flatter his wife somehow or another. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) You get to marry him. You get to marry me, Me. baby. (laughs) Yay. (laughs) I'm going to kill the one who would have made the better husband. (laughs) Let you marry me. (laughs) You got stuck with me. But you're great. (laughs) And hey, fictional me is loaded. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, real life Tolstoy was kind of loaded too. He was, yeah. yeah. I don't think Jane Austen has a better section than the section where Pierre finally finds himself with money and suddenly everyone's interested in, in him. Yeah, yeah. And it it says something do. like, because Pierre found himself interesting, it never occurred to him <laughs> yeah. that there would be anything unnatural about everyone else suddenly thinking he's interesting. Yeah. His time had come. His time had come, yeah. People finally began to see his self-worth, his value, his interest. It had nothing to do whatsoever with him instantly inheriting a gajillion dollars. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the beautiful marble-like Helene is suddenly interested in him. And, and Anna Scherer wants him at the soirees yes. all of a sudden. And they're all like, oh, <laughs> you're okay now, buddy. <laughs> and I love that Vasily just says, yay, you got engaged. <laughs> like he, he's like i need to just congratulations oh, yeah that was great <laughs> Pierce. just like okay i guess i did that's what, I, that's what i'm gonna do to my kids <laughs> pick the boy i want them to marry and just run in there you're engaged oh that's wonderful <laughs> congratulations yeah when are you gonna buy the ring yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then immediately finds himself despising her oh I man mean, elena's yeah we talked about her last episode yeah right? i guess we did she's a she's a bit of a scamp she that, is. That Helena. But she, yeah, so... Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was just going to wrap up that thought on Pierre. Yeah. I think by the epilogue, Tolstoy has learned to have some tenderness for Pierre. Because mm-hmm. there actually seems to be real joy when Pierre comes home. Yeah. And well, Pierre's some, learned some things. Yeah, right? there's something missing without Pierre in that home. And Pierre brings it. He's like the big happy Santa Claus. He right. brings everybody gifts. If it was just with Nikolai... But doesn't he even say that, like, Pierre wasn't really a gift giver, but he just sort of clued into this is a way to doesn't he say something like something that? Something like that. Yeah, 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 you're right. There's a lot of things. It like wasn't that. because he was just naturally doing it to get people's He you know. he's not a it wasn't like he was a gift giver. It's not his love language or anything like that. But you know, he realized that he has means and he knows other figures out other people respond to it and he just sort of assumes this sort of yeah. mm-hmm. benevolent. Yeah. And if there's anything we know about Pierre it is that he can be very absent-minded and forgetful, mm-hmm. but he does genuinely care about people. Right. He is very tender towards people, mm-hmm. which is why it was very difficult for him with Elena. Helena. Mm-hmm. So, and so you get that just to at the end of this with just, if it was just with Nikolai and Sonia, it would be a happy household, but it would be very, it would be missing something. Right. And Natasha grows up basically to be Antonia. 
<laughs> mm, yeah, basically. Which was interesting that he had her do that. She yeah. fills out, becomes kind of just a yep. matronly housewife. Yeah. So completely gives up her all yeah. of her charms. Yeah, except for the ones that Pierre enjoys. Mm. So, which I, I mean, I did not find that out. We'll talk, I'm sure, more about Natasha. Mm-hmm. But. No, it made sense. It made sense. Yeah. And so then here was Pierre, and he brings a sort of life and poetry to the household. Yeah. That would be missing without him. Well, actually, even earlier, even before Pierre's transformation, before he goes crazy, it is weird. I had forgotten. This book has so much stuff. Pierre decides he's going to kill Napoleon. (laughs) (laughs) And he uses numerology to do it. Yeah, and goes on a whole killing Napoleon adventure in the story. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man, that's weird. A lesser novelist would have just made it about that, too. I mean, you have so many stories in this book. Yeah. Well... The fact that Tolstoy doesn't feel the need to make that make sense with anything else. Just like, well, here's another crazy thing that happened. It's... But for anybody who's anything like Pierre, you sympathize because you, like, if you're not committed to staying the path, you are you allow yourself to be this thrown this way and that by your crazy sentiments and dreams and ideas. Right. And you want to do a cardinal act of virtue that yeah. exonerates you for all the things that you feel guilty about. You want to do one thing that just allows you to feel like you have taken an active role in your life. You don't have the diligence and the self-control to do it consistently. So it's like, I'm just going to kill Napoleon or I'm just going to have a duel with Zdolikov. Yeah, it's that sort of self-mythologizing you were talking about too. Right. It's not necessarily because he thinks about himself as the most important person ever. He just can't imagine his life where it's not that significant. Right. (laughs) Well, Andre doesn't get caught up in that. He doesn't think about how his life needs to be that significant and therefore he actually ends up leading the more significant life (laughs) right well he starts out wanting that glory and he he does he he learns within the space of about two books that that was all bosh bosh (laughs) yeah balderdash when he meets that one guy what was his name the it was a really good portrait of that character which character the one who was going to kind of take over for a while he was like the emperor's right hand man yeah. Smirnoff. Yeah. It's not Smirnoff. That's uh Smirnoff, yeah. What is that guy's name? I don't remember. The guy that gets banished to Siberia for yeah. some random just the political winds blow in the opposite of his favor. But when Andre goes finally to his house to eat dinner with him and his friends, remember that scene? That's a great little scene. And Andre's it's like the balloons deflated. Right. It's like this guy's just like everybody else. Yeah. Everybody's laughing at the guy's jokes. It's like this has there's no great glory to this and he's mm-hmm. just like I'm going to go stand in front of the line with my guys and get shot and killed. Right. <laughs> yep. And he promptly does. Did you guys buy Pierre's final? What What were we to make of, was his final transformation supposed to be the good one in the novel? The suffering that he did? Are we supposed to look at that as just as glorious and transformative as Pierre looks at it? Well, the fact that it kind of stays steady through the epilogue is a he, sign he's that He's not, not the same person after yeah. that. For one, he I don't get the sense grow. that- He does take on some real gravity and strength and yeah and he's learning from a man about certain things as opposed to trying on a philosophy Mm -hmm. i think he's kind of giving up philosophies there at the end right yeah it's not like he's necessarily trying to be a mason anymore or trying to be or trying to find the perfect philosophy Mm -hmm. yeah he sort of gives that up and just then tries to take on these principles of what it means to live well that he learned from that right (sighs) well whatever his name was it's not kudasov no it's not that's the general yeah, I think with Pierre, his trajectory is for him to mature out of thinking that he always has to have a philosophy that can fit his life. Yeah. I think maybe the reason I asked the question is because I'm always uncomfortable at the end of the day with Tolstoy's redemptive strategies. It's the one weakness of Anna Kay is where Levin ends. There's always this kind of self-denial, become a small man. Except the everyday. Except and... the everyday. I mean, there's a lot of wisdom and truth in that, but it always feels like his characters end Well, you see the signs of that weird mysticism that would eventually lead him to abandon his own family. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's always there. Yeah. Because even in War and Peace, I don't think you're, I think you're supposed to feel the tragedy of Russia being a country that will end up killing a man like Pierre. Right. But I don't think you're supposed to necessarily hate Pierre for what he's about to do. Well, what about, I mean, what happens to Pierre is he suddenly, I mean, like he feels like he all his possessions and all the material of his life, which he's always trying to actively escape from. He just feels untangled by it. And then he discovers that, hey, I've got a bunch of money. I'm going to buy people gifts with it. And magically, my I'm going to end up saving money somehow. Mm-hmm. 
okay, cool, whatever. Yeah. Right. I don't care. I don't really care about any of it. I'm going to buy the house in Moscow, Moscow because I guess it's the right thing to do, even though it's going to cost a whole lot of money and right. it's not really smart, but it's for Moscow, whatever. He was uh, he, he was so wrapped up in those kinds of concerns before and he was, you know, everything that he did ended up costing him more and never working out the way it was supposed to. And mm-hmm. Finally, he's learned to stop fighting and love the bomb. You don't seem completely satisfied with this, Nathan. Well, I'm just not satisfied with Tolstoy, I guess. Yeah. I mean... He's a bad writer. Yeah, he's a bad writer. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it comes down to. A little bit of a jerk, really. Ernest yeah. Fine is my true hero. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, at least he has a solution to life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't forget to play video games when you're young because it could come in useful later. I don't like where Andre ends. I don't like him in the ward as Anatol's getting ampu- his leg amputated thinking, I forgive you. And having this kind of well, zen moment of, I can just forgive everyone. I have this nebulous thing called love flowing through me. And then I don't like the detachment. I don't like detachments, maybe the word that I'm looking for. The characters always end up detached they end up a little bit zen a little bit like well actually we're all gonna die actually relationships don't last actually there's not a lot that we can really hold on to but if we love our country and we kind of do the right thing and we don't hold anything too tightly and we believe in some idea of love or god whatever that means then we're gonna be okay yeah i agree with that to an extent except it would be a stronger case if that's what he was trying to say if he then ended the book with andre right Pierre, I don't think necessarily ends there. He actually ends very much concerned about the people in his house. That's true. He loves those people. That's true. And I think that that's probably because... The reason I mean, this, he becomes a gift giver is because Natasha never asks for anything for herself and is becomes like adds... Was he, you know, she reduces all these things, but she adds stinginess to her character traits mm-hmm. or whatever yeah. is how he puts it, something like that. And so she's stingy. She never asks for anything for herself. And so he just decides to become this generous gift giver for everybody and for her. And they have this like play where she excoriates him for spending so much, but also loves everything that he gets her and Mm -hmm. he feels great about it and even feels good about taking the abuse. And that's just like, yay. Right. But that's the whole thing is the transformation is peers just suddenly oriented to other people and what they need and what they want and what they expect in a more self forgetful way. But not entirely detached, right? Yeah, no, it's not entirely detached. And I think that's part of why the more we talk about this, the more I am convinced. And I I don't even know if there's really an argument that what's his future is the, the, the Decemberist revolt mm-hmm. and that it will be a sad ending for his the Bezikov family. But that's just because, I mean, Tolstoy wants you to understand the loss that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Here's this whole transformation that happened. These people whose lives were you've spent pages and pages with and then this new emperor is going to do this to them. But if that's the, where Pierre lands, then I don't know. Did he really achieve the kind of uh, self-growth that were, I mean, he went off and d- died for some dumb cause ideal yeah, based on another one of his crackpot absent-minded notions that don't take into account his family or the people that he should love and care about. It kind of feels like that just circles back to, well, Pierre's always going to Pierre. Yeah. He's always going to be the dreamer, the romantic, the disconnected. Yeah. Natasha is... Natasha, like she is Russia, she grounds him as much as she can. But ultimately, I, I mean, I could be wrong. He's here. just going to float into space, just like Andre. Yeah, I could be wrong here, but I think part of it is that the reaction to the guys in the December's revolt—they never really imagined that it was going to be that strong. Mm-hmm. So the reaction that happened was. Well, you read Pierre talking about what he's getting into, and he just thinks that yeah, this is to everybody's mutual advantage, obviously. Right, and you imagine the people who were like in the early days of um, communism. Some of them probably did not quite realize that Stalin was going to be that brutal. I hope zero of them realized that. Yeah. And so, I mean, there is that to keep in mind. I don't know. I mean, I could almost cast this as you've got our two main characters, Pierre and Andre. They both ultimately are going to float into a kind of disconnection from reality. And they're both going to die for it or die die with it. So they suffer. They learn to be detached because of their suffering. And that is their redemption. That is their redemption, and then they and then they die. There's nothing really else for them. Pierre's grounded for a while because well, that's of, trash redemption. If that's what's happening, yeah, that's what I'm. That's the that's the. Angst. Yeah, if you think that that's if you think that that's redemptive, and you're the kind of person that would read this book and be like, oh, I will, I too will suffer and learn detachment and mm-hmm. be redeemed. Stick to Dostoevsky. Yeah, stick to Dostoevsky. He'll scratch you where you itch. 
and, two, and also be worse for it. repent of yeah. your <laughs> you could do that stupid too. idiotic idea of redemption and your masochistic Gnostic I, I love imbecility. I think that there are some very dumb readings of this novel, Jake. Some very dumb, self-abnegating, silly Dostoevskian readings of this book. And I think that Tolstoy might have had a little bit of that in them. I don't know that he's totally above all of it. No, he's not. But what's great about Tolstoy is the fact that he's always, his work is always bigger than his silly philosophies. Yes, I think that that's well, true. Look, why why does why do people want to say that suffering is redemptive in and of itself? Because suffering does change you and it 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 shows you that you can live and survive without the comforts and ease of this life. It shows you that there's more to life than things. It shows you that well, man, Mac- simply having a some self-discipline and and some mental toughness goes a long way and there's a a maturity that can be reached through enduring physical suffering and the discipline that comes with it. And so, yeah, people do grow through suffering. That's why boot camp works, Mm -hmm. right? Like boot camp teaches you to harden yourself and to- What you're capable of, actually. And and really shows you you're capable of much more than you ever imagined. And more elite the branch of the military, the more intense the boot camp. And Mm -hmm. that's why everybody flunks out of Navy SEALs, but the toughest of the tough. And okay, that's all cool. And that's all great. But you know what? If your suffering still doesn't cause you to turn to Christ, then it's a, how redemptive is it? It's not redemptive in and of itself, not in any kind of complete or truly meaningful way. And so if we want to talk about, we could get to the place where we got to at the end of Anna Karenina, which is like, well, you know, this is all great until we go off the rails at the very end. And Yeah, I think you, you, put, you put your finger on it. That's why I don't actually like Pierre's final transformation. It feels so spiritual, and it comes so close to being something really real and something very religious which feeling makes in the it book. Counterfeit. Which makes it counterfeit. If it was just like he yeah. suffered and became a better man, well, we've read a million books that do that well, right? I mean, that's a that's a trope, and for a reason. Well, yeah, and it's why I mean, you know, and we've talked about this sort of thing on th- the Sound of Sanity, and Pastor Weeks just preached a sermon about this sort of thing. You know, all the self-help gurus out there, the masculinity gurus mm-hmm. out there, they want to teach you all these things that, you know, helpful lessons about how to grow as a man, how to mature as a man, and things that are cathartic in and of themselves. But you take all of that without Jesus, what mm-hmm. you have is a really sophisticated cathartic counterfeit that is all the more dangerous and deadly. Right. And I think there is there is a sense in which Tolstoy actually does offer that counterfeit. Like you read my Ant- 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 how do you say her name? My Antonia. You read my Antonia. She suffers. She becomes a better woman. That's the story. It's not offered as prescriptive. You're not. You're not like, oh, I need to suffer like Antonia. You admire her for how she suffered and how she carried through it, but you're not thinking like this is. I too would benefit from going to prison and need to find a way to make a prison for myself. Right. This is a spiritual end in and of itself. Tolstoy wants you. To, I think at the end of the day to put suffering to put some kind of transcendent idea of getting outside of yourself as the ultimate religious and spiritual yes. and intellectual good and that's just kind of silly and it's pretty attractive to a certain sort of person well it's pretty attractive to a lot of people go climb up the stairs of the cathedral on your knees mm-hmm. make a pilgrimage lash yourself on the back like for centuries and centuries and centuries people have found ways to try to atone for their sins Mm -hmm. and deal with their indwelling sin through asceticism and physical external suffering. And it, Paul says in Colossians, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. And then he goes on to say, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new or Sabbath. These are shadows of things to come. The substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you as insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind, not holding fast to the head. If with Christ you died to the elemental principles, spirits of the world, why as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch according to human precepts and teaching. They all have the appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they're of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. That's what people have done for millennia. You want to treat your body harshly. Why? On the one hand, you feel like you need to have some kind of atonement for the sins that you've committed. And on the other hand, you feel like 
well, I can't deal with this indwelling sin problem, this thing inside of me that wants all of these sinful things. Maybe if I just deny, deny, deny myself, treat my body harshly, that'll somehow work itself from the outside in. And that's not how it works. And physical di- discipline is of some value, but at the end of the day, it's a, it's a new man. It's a renewed man in Christ, a new creation by the Spirit of God. And this is just a different kind of ascetic penance. Go become a, a monk, be a Roman Catholic monk, be a Buddhist monk, whatever. It's not going to get you what you want. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But as Brandon was saying, Tolstoy is better than his philosophy. He's a better writer than he is a philosopher. Yeah. So what I've been thinking here is you guys are right. And what Jake's been saying is very helpful and spot on. But as I was, as I've read this many, many times, Mm -hmm. that was never the lesson I took away from him. You know, I never felt like because I read Tolstoy, I wanted to go and suffer more. Right. Even though it's there, that is what he's proposing with Andre and Pierre. But then he's sensible enough to give you Maria. Who's much? Yeah. Who's more complicated than that? And he makes a little bit of fun of her for some self-flagellating. Reason, well, and also, what I've learned, I think, most from Tolstoy is just to take to just really appreciate what surrounds me at the moment. To like the intensity of the way that he feels about certain scenes mm-hmm. and the way that those have stuck with me for so long. Yeah, I I don't take that away either. But Nathan's suggesting that lots of people do. Yeah, and I think that I've seen them. And I think that I've they seen do. them in and researching I, I think this. That, I've seen yeah. them say. Let's look at the Pierre prison thing. I mean, and especially dopey Christians yeah, no, will no, no, just no. say it is redemption. And yeah. it's like, no. I wasn't arguing against it's that. It's icky. Yeah, I was no, trying to figure out why. What I, why we were resistant to him even trying to pursue the line yeah. from the beginning. The, what I take away, what I've taken away from Tolstoy is just, hey. Life. Yeah. The big cosmic global stuff, it's a great way to hide from your problems. And pretend like your problems are, you know, the, what, what's the corresponding thing? It's uh, to Tolstoy's characters that are so invested in, you know, these political philosophies or whatever. It's, it's, you know, getting rid of Trump or supporting Trump or climate change or, you know, right. something really big like that. And Tolstoy's like, eh, you can't really do much about that. I mean, he says, yourself, you yourself, you're not changing the political philosophies of this. You yourself. Climate change, if it's a thing or not a thing, doesn't matter. You personally are not going to impact it all that much. And it's not going to impact you. I mean, I don't know that we would go as far with Tolstoy, but I think what Tolstoy wants to say is Obama, Trump, who cares? Your life goes on. Yeah, life goes on. He loves to he loves to put that. He explicitly says that again and again. And it doesn't really matter what happens at the at the end of the day. The musiques are going to keep living and dying and having babies. And for them, what changes? You know, a bunch of rich people in a room talking. Shuffled around some cards and... shuffle, Yeah, shuffling papers and publishing briefs doesn't do anything mm-hmm. to them. It doesn't change anything for them. And so Tolstoy is like, you know, I don't know. Maybe don't think that you can change the world if you can't, like, love your wife and kids and keep a good house and stuff. Mm-hmm. Maybe just... Maybe that's the way that you do change the world. Maybe just... Focus on that. And as Brandon's saying, he paints those scenes. So, I mean, nobody can do a childbirth or a marriage or something like, like, like that, like Tolstoy. He brings them to life in a way. Yeah, he enforces and reinforces that idea. Right. In a way, and With his illustrates art. it mm-hmm. in a way that... Yeah, just an awareness of your current life. Not what you want it to be, not what you wished it would be, but just where you are at that moment. Like, that's, I think, the value of, like, the hunting scenes. Mm-hmm. It's just this intensity of the way that he's aware of things. Yeah, it's, not just like a, it's not just like a philosophy of living in the now. It's just... We are in the now, and here's yeah. what it's like. And he's, his, his awareness is so keen that he can pick us up a couple hundred years later and just plop us down and make us feel it. It's like a sense memory. I mean, we've said this kind of thing before, but it's and like I've been And make us feel hunting. it in a context that we have absolutely... No context for. No context for, mm. or even natural sympathies for. Yeah. Like we, and yeah. we've all said this now, but who cares about Russia understands yeah, there's Russia, nothing romantic about Russia gets Russia under like who really has any romanticism for Russia these are the cold hearted bad guys from James Bond movies that's basically how I still think of them it's like suddenly you get it you feel the Russian blood coursing through <laughs> yeah. your veins yeah. as yeah. you hop on your horse and <laughs> your troika your troika yeah let's go hunt some wolves guys oh <laughs> you know? and Russian Christmas and 
Let's do it. Let's go hunt some wolves. Let's, go, let's hunt some wolves. Let's put on our member costumes and go visit Pastor Bailey. Right. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> that would be great. Are we? T- is it time to talk about Natasha? Natasha, Natasha, Natasha. Natasha. Yeah. Natasha. Let's do it. What do you guys think about Natasha? Oh, actually, I did want to say one other thing, and this will kind of be a good lead in, I think, to Natasha. For all his philosophizing, whatever he wants to say about Pierre, whatever he wants to say about Andre, Tolstoy does love the man of the people. And I think in some ways, Nikolai ends up being the most or one of the most sympathetic characters, at least for me, because he's yeah. just he's like, yay, Trump. You know, he supports the emperor. <laughs> make him make Russia great again. <laughs> and then he's like, ah, oh, that's kind of dumb. <laughs> and then he falls in love with a pretty chick. And then he falls in love with a different chick who he rescues and she becomes pretty. And it's just like all so boring and human. He's just kind yeah, of a lovable gonna, Russian. He's just your normal everyday guy. He's yeah. everybody's brother, Steve. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. he's just like he's he's if, if you're if you're the poet Andre type or the you know, if, if, if you're the cold, ambitious Andre or you're, you're the poet Pierre type, then probably, you know, your younger brother that's always working on cars or whatever. Yeah, that's Nikolai. Yeah. Yep. And. <laughs> And he's probably the best man of all of them. And he's probably yeah. the best man of all of them. And he's going to fly off the handle and beat his surf. And then he's going to go and cry and apologize to his wife. And he's going to always think his wife is like cooler and more spiritual than he is. But he's also going to look he's down on her for being a woman. on the one hand. Yeah. And yeah, a little. Probably flies off the handle with his kids. But then is sorry that he did. He's going to read the things that he knows he's supposed to read and feel pleasure in learning from them while getting absolutely nothing out of them. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) He's just a dude. Yeah. And I think Tolstoy, whatever his philosophy is, I think he loves that kind of person. I think the reason I connected to leading into Natasha is I think Natasha actually is, becomes at least another character like that. Someone who's just practical and real and what Tolstoy, I, I suspect saw as, as Russian as, yeah. you know, the character of... Despite their father. Yeah. Father is just like a, a, a Jane Austen a character. Goofball. Yeah, goofball. What do you guys think about that? Natasha. Oh, man. Nathan, what do I think about Natasha? Mm-hmm. I think she's great. <laughs> <laughs> I think as far as the well... I mean, she's one of the most well-drawn characters of the book. Um, is she Brendan? Your life, little girl, is an empty page. Yeah. That men will want to write on. Is she well drawn, Brandon, or is she just may the manic pixie dream girl? No, that is she there would, to. She would have been a manic pixie, pixie dream girl in any other book, but in this book, she's got like a depth and a reality to her. She, Sonia, all these char- all these female characters have a heft to them that match anything with the men. Yeah, like I, fact, I really think that thing that I I said earlier. What if Elizabeth was also Lydia? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Elizabeth Bennett was also Lydia. I think that that's really true of. Natasha, you have a very young, 15, 16 year old, impressionable. You know, remember though, Elizabeth was taken in by Wickham. Yeah. Right? And Elizabeth was 19. So, what, that's three years or something like that. Yeah. So very, very young, beautiful, in the springtime of life, vivacious. She can sing. She's got it all. And then, you know, there's Andre. Mm-hmm. It's a little crazy. It's an older guy, yeah. you know, but they have a, understanding and it's it's not wrong wickham then, shows up and well then andre decides not to get married <laughs> what an idiot for a year you moron. because he listens to his father uh, well and he picked somebody who was not in the place of life who could handle it mm-hmm. yeah and so he goes away a year to a 16 year old girl however old she was at the time that's forever is forever and he leaves and she goes to the ballet or the opera whatever she goes to mm-hmm. and uh oh man our incestuous <laughs> villains. There's Anatoly. I, I mean, was so angry. Tolstoy really, really hated the theater and opera. <laughs> yeah, he just. Oh man, yeah. Is it? Karenina has a great scene where Anna goes to the opera or something yeah. like that. It's the same thing, right? <laughs> well, I love. Yeah. Well, there's in his book, "What Is Art?" He just spends so much time talking about how ballet's just mm-hmm. overtly sexualized with all the tight outfits on. Did stage we read and, some of this before? Yeah, almost? I think okay. yeah, or I've mentioned we, it. We did. Yeah. yeah. It's just like a 1950s or 60s author with a chip on their shoulder about TV, you know, yeah. writing about. <laughs> and then the vapid commercials came on and yeah. the announcer said something stupid and it feels exactly the same to me. The only reason people are there is so they can be looked at. Right. <laughs> yeah. Just a status symbol for the rich. Uh, so she goes to the thing. Yeah. And there's pretty boy. Pretty boy. 
And, and everybody's conspiring and all the things are lining up. And Helena is conspiring. Yeah. Yeah. yeah she's just, she's a monster. And her dad is like almost protecting the old the princess. Old battle axe lady. Uh, yeah. Is Mary, almost, yeah. almost protect, got her protected mm. and almost and almost and almost and. But not, not quite. Mm-hmm. Not quite. Ah, uh, it was so. Old. I love that this book that has no plot suddenly has a soap opera right in yeah. the middle of it, and it's a real page and turner. You can't stop. Yeah, and it's just oh man. But you have. I mean, it's you can sympathize because we all have those little moments in our life where suddenly, for a week or two, it is it a, is a soap, soap opera. opera. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The one bone that he throws us is that he actually makes us not like Natasha. Yeah. Which makes it go down a little bit easier. Yeah, she's just uh, being a bit of a brat there, unfortunately. Yeah. And you like Man- Maria Dmitrievna, and you like her father, yeah. and all the what they end up doing. Yeah, they end up doing good things. They try like, to drag Anatoly into the house. Yeah. I really liked Sonia there. Hilarious. I mean, Sonia's yeah. so sweet and yeah. protecting her friend. It kind of, it, that's the part that makes it kind of stink what happens to Sonia in the end. Sonia's, what's that character? And she's the most like... Dickensian? That's what I wanted to say. She's like Esther Summerson? Well, or she's like, uh, what's the angelic chick in Jane Eyre? Like, oh, Jane. There's a couple of them. Helen. But the, the one I think you're thinking of is in Emma. The And I think her name is Jane. Oh, I was thinking, no, I was thinking of Helen Helen and Jane Eyre. The friend? Oh, Jane Eyre, Jane Eyre. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm thinking Jane Austen. Yes, 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 yes. Helen. Oh, yeah. I, was, I, th- I thought maybe. Yeah. But I think Tolstoy knows that that's a trope. I think he's read Dickens and I think... I feel him having a little fun with it and saying, actually, yeah, those so girls don't get a happy ending. <laughs> you need to be not, a little so assertive not, in life. <laughs> yeah, so not perfect. She don't send her... a letter, you moron. <laughs> no one's gonna, you're She's not going like, to get rewarded for that. I've got this all figured out. Yeah, yeah, instead of feeling... She's playing her game and she played herself. Right. Instead yeah. of feeling like she might be jealous and not understanding why everybody appreciates her, but that only being the reason that you're supposed to realize that she's even that much more perfect. Mm-hmm. She actually is jealous. She actually does get angry. She actually... She's not going to write the angelic, self-sacrificial letter unless she is convinced that it plays it all to her, her advantage. Yeah. She's not as self-effacing, just like yeah. Maria, you know. She's religious, but she still gets... One of the great scenes is when she's trying to teach little Nikolashinka, mm-hmm. and she admits that she gets angry yeah, at him. Yeah, she just gets yeah. mad at him. And she's like her father, and she's like, that horrifies her. Yeah. But I mean, imagine Dickens letting one of his angelic women feel that way. He never would. Mm-hmm. No. I, Maria, to me, is a one of the best characters, and I guess we can talk about her in a second. Sonia, maybe I'm just a sentimentalist. It feels like he stacks, he ends up stacking the deck a little bit against her, I think. Um, I mean, it all plays out the way that it would, but the fact that he had it play that out feels like a rare instance of Tolstoy making a point. Like, there's something a little didactic about it. Just like, guess what? uh, Maria, like she, what's the nice way of saying? Maria figured out. She had the gumption and she was classy. And she was classy. But she, right. that's what you were saying. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, well, she's from, I mean, one of the disadvantages th- that Sonia always had was that she. Oh, yeah. She had a little class. But Maria also, after all her self denial, I got like, it. Fanny. I, I, yeah. I right. It out now. Maria, Maria re- realized, like, oh, Maria says, I need to seize my destiny. I'm going to go after Nikolai. I'm actually going to get what I want and I'm capable of doing it. And Sonia is like, I'm going to play these games of self denial and it backfires and she's sunk. And it feels like there's kind of a lesson and maybe a little thumbing our nose at Dickens and, you know, the Jane Eyre's of the world well, who want to sentimentalize that. I mean, I think that you can read a lot of this as Dickens, I mean, Tolstoy just by sheer talent, thumbing his nose at yes. pretty much every writer. Yes, I agree. <laughs> he thumbs his nose a little bit at Jane Austen too. Oh, with, yeah. Like the whole scene with, was it, uh, which, Julia, that mm-hmm. friend Julia Corrigan when she marries Boris? Oh, that's yeah. a great little Austen-esque yeah, you're like, section. Yeah. In like two chapters, he writes a Jane Austen novel. Right? <laughs> Are they the ones that throw the party that's <laughs> yeah, slightly yeah. beyond their means, but they figure out how to make it just, just like, like all your, the other people's yeah. parties, and they're so proud of themselves yeah. for being just as boring and stupid as <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> very stupid as everybody else. <laughs> yeah, that's very Anne Berg, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is her uh, Natasha's yeah. sister. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Vera. <laughs> There's a Bo- character Boris that Tolstoy is, doesn't lose a lot of love right, for. So Boris was the one who was supposed to marry Natasha. Right. Right. And then he ends up marrying Julia because she's loaded. Exactly. Right. Yeah. She got that money, man. But mm-hmm. she's like her painted makeup face, all that stuff. And it's just hilarious, yeah. those scenes. Yeah. It's like, yeah. She was ugly, yeah. but she had money. Got so the money. He, he, he made his trade. Yeah. He pretended <laughs> to be a poet. Yeah. Was... He pretended to do all this stuff. 
Because he was trying to make his decision about money. And I love that it works. I love that there's absolutely no recrimination. He got cold feet. She was like, I'm going to make you jealous. You yeah. Know. He was like, crap. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah. And you it know. never ends up, we, we never really get like, was his mom just a social climber for him? Or was she a genuinely good? Tolstoy never really gives well, us I mean, the it's verdict. because it's both. Right? Yeah, I think It's that's like true. most people. There's all sorts of different motives. And yeah. some of them are ugly. Yeah. Some of them are good. I mean, people are, they're never cartoon figures. Like, mm-hmm. even though I love Dickens, I mean, I've said that many times. Right. Wait, do you love Dickens? I, I do like Dickens mm-hmm. quite okay. a bit. I was confused. I, even though he's, I don't so much. I don't he's know. lowered a couple notches in my estimation, mm-hmm. especially, but I think it's just a matter of maturing. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I'll ever hate Dickens, but I don't think he'll ever like hold a Tolstoy, a Tolstoyan Tol- pedestal. Tolstoyan but. pedestal. Characters are never one dimensional with Tolstoy. The closest we get is Helena. Right. But they're always just very complicated. So even like Dolokhov, mm-hmm. he gets. He loves his mom. He loves his mom. Yeah. yeah. And you're like, that's great. Yeah. Tolstoy is never lower. He doesn't lower himself to <clears throat> making you hate a character just for the sake of having that character mm-hmm. fill that role and position of being the hateable character. So. Helena. Yeah. Helena. I mean, he have, he'll, he'll occasionally admit that there are characters like that in life. But I think that's just, yeah, I think but that's I, it. I think he's saying, you know there what? Are. There are monsters in life. There are. Uh, where were we? They're never one dimensional. No, they're not. Although I would say, so Jake said, Jake muttered the line, the pad for men to write on thing uh, from Sound of Music when we brought up Natasha. And I think Tolstoy, this is like really uncomfortable to say, and maybe I'll end up cutting it out. But I think Tolstoy gets at with both youth and especially with young ladies, I think he act- accurately captures with great depth their shallowness. Like they're actually just isn't a lot to Natasha and she went as, as a 16 year old girl and he's pretty deadly realistic about that. Yeah. If you've met a 16 year old girl before, like some of them that have some things going, but some of them are just kind of like a vibrant life force and that's it. Yep. And they're kind of waiting for, you know, a Pierre to imprint on and then they'll turn into something <laughs> with a lot of personality. You sexist pig. I, <laughs> I feel like a sexist pig saying this, but well, you know, Tolstoy is just you brave marry and, Natasha to Andre. She's such a different woman. She becomes a different woman. Yeah, and you can see formative Natasha, pro, you know, young Natasha. You can see Natasha becoming just a very different person by marrying Andre than what she becomes or becoming gone through what running she off went with through. Anatole and becoming whatever she would become there. Yeah, exactly. That's, what those are she three beca- different she becomes women. Anna Karenina if she does that. Right. Like And those are three women that are unrecognizable to each other. Like Yeah, and you can see, but you can you can trace it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's you not, know, these are the decisions that lots of people make. Like and there are lots of people that you look at in life and it's a you know would could like what if. Right. And I think Tolstoy understands that about young people in general not just women, but there is something specific to the way that Tolstoy portrays his young ladies that rings very true to me and that they are kind of, he calls Sonia a sterile flower because she never gets a chance to bloom, but he really gets at this reality that a lot of young ladies are waiting to And it's interesting because he gives you the alternative too when a woman gets past a certain point. Mm -hmm. Like Maria, she's older. Right. And she has actually become something. She's also suffered a lot. Yeah. Yeah. She's been abused, for lack of a better word. I yeah, mean, and so she already is something, and actually that is what Nikolai needed mm-hmm. because it makes him a better man. Right. Nikolai needs a woman that's more mature than him. Yeah. Pierre actually can weirdly carry the weight of Natasha. And she becomes what he needs. She becomes solid and real and mm-hmm. practical. And Yep. Oh, man. That last chapter, the the epilogue, the, the chapter of Pierre and Natasha's marriage, describing what it's like. I don't know if I said this on last podcast, but that might be my favorite chapter of fiction I've read ever, maybe in a long time. I'm sure a lot of it has to do with the fact that I'm newly married, but there's no, just so much that's relatable. It's as good as and you true. think it is. It, and it's... I mean, the fa- the thing where she purifies his arguments. I'm sorry, folks, if I said we had such a scattered discussion last time. I don't know what I have said and haven't said, <laughs> but <laughs> he will make some offhand comment like i think the example in the book is we should we shouldn't use nursemaids and he doesn't even know if he means it and then she just takes that argument and suddenly they never have another nursemaid and when he says eh we should probably use a nursemaid she fights him tooth and claw wet nurse. yeah a wet nurse sorry yeah 
nursemaid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. But I was like, wait a minute. That's not quite right. <laughs> <laughs> no. But just the idea that some offhand thing that I say can be transformed into the law of our home. That, that will be enforced against you. <laughs> against my own will. And that I will not be able to get out from under. Oh, man. <laughs> I, uh, I've i experienced a little bit of that. I, I have definitely felt that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, may, I said that? Oh, also the fact where uh, the part where Pierre comes back for having forgotten the things that he was supposed to buy. Yeah. And he's astonished at what a big deal that is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, there's just, I, I, I'm not going to bore people by recounting them all but detail after detail after detail rang true and was beautifully observed and it's just like it it made me sad for the tolstoys that their marriage ended so poorly that his life ended so poorly that he wasn't faithful because there's a lot of sweetness and there's a lot of really beautiful tender observation of and not just between husband and wife but just i think what it helps you realize too is your the effect that you can have on not just your own children, but those who are around you mm-hmm. a lot. Yeah. It the was, servants. It especially spoke every, to me this time because, yeah. With Nicholas Shinka. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're like, you really can have an effect on a child who just, even they just occasionally see you, but mm-hmm. they just yeah. look up to you. Yeah. And Pierre just doesn't understand. He doesn't understand what really he's doing. grasp what yeah. he's doing to that kid. Or who, how important he is to him in general. Like he right. just, he just doesn't put it together. And Nikolai doesn't also grasp how. Well, that's just. Man, that's so common. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's easy uh, in positions of leadership to be that way too, because you carry with you your own insecurities and your own mm-hmm. doubts. And you don't think you're anything special. You don't think you're anything special. You don't think what you said is particularly special, but you say it to the kid who really looks up to you as a father figure because he's, you know, he doesn't have a good dad or he, you know, or, you know, he just looks up to you because you're, you're there and you love him mm-hmm. and you just, don't gauge the impact that that you have and therefore on the one hand you can really hurt somebody in that position by not having any regard for your impact on the other hand you don't say the things that you should say that Mm. would really bring your considerably considerably underestimated influence to bear in helping the nicholas shenka in your life to Mm -hmm. helping form his character or set him on the path or trajectory that that would be good for him yeah, I've been on both sides of that. And it, it was fascinating as Nicholas, when you're on the Nicholas Shenka side, like there are moments in my life, especially growing up with a dad that was checked out. There are like moments with pastors, with mentors, with counselors that are so iconic and indelible in my memory. And the other person doesn't, like it was nothing. Like they, they, they don't even remember that it happened. Yep. But to me, it was like the defining thing, you know? So yeah, it's a very common dynamic and beautifully observed here. I don't know. Is there anything else to say about Natasha? I don't think. I mean, I just want to say, I think Tolstoy gets, he gets the folly of youth without ever seeming to be condescending or nasty towards it. When they all have that conversation at Christmas time yeah. about like life, man, it's, it goes by so fast. <laughs> so deep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when they all smoke a joint and have that dumb conversation. And then their tutor joins them. Yeah. The tutor. Yeah. It's yeah. like a perfectly observed, I, I, I help out in, our high school youth group at church, right? I hear those conversations all the time. Weekly, I hear that because that same conversation and Tolstoy observes it perfectly and he doesn't, he's not snide about it. Yeah. He's having maybe a little fun with it, but he's really not nasty. Like you can imagine Jane Austen just making you feel like those characters were the dumbest <laughs> idiots <laughs> in the world. <laughs> How dare you have an existential thought, you peon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. You're, and, you're 15. <laughs> right. Yeah. And she'd be hilarious and she'd be right. But <laughs> this is just beautiful, and you know he has compassion. I, I think compassion is the word. Well, for, you for know Tolstoy. what, Miss Austin. In order to be able to make fun of it, you kind of have to have lived it, right? You yeah. have to walk. Everybody walks through it, and you did, by the and way. You did, and so have a little compassion, right? Yep. Uh, what do you guys want to say about Maria? I guess that's the other major character that we haven't talked about, right? Talk about Nikolai, Nikolai a little bit. I don't know what else there is to say. And I think I said what I wanted to about her, which yeah. is that he brings a level of reality to a character that could have very easily been like this Dickensian perfect angelic yeah. figure. Because she's religious and she, through her suffering, she's learned so much. But then he has these elements like she she gets angry when she mm-hmm. teaches. She yeah. sees her father and herself, all these little touches that he uses to make sure that she's very three-dimensional. Yeah. There's really nothing sickly sweet about her. She's not Helen from... 
Jane Eyre. And that's a trick because how many books have we read that have that character type and we just end up vomiting them out? Like yeah. we don't, I mean, we could probably sit here, you know, you got like the, the girls from Dracula are kind of like that. Yep. Sweet and simpering and put upon. Uh, certainly Jane Eyre has a couple characters like that. Yeah. You realize it takes a lot of, well, it takes... It takes an imagination that realizes that those sorts of characters don't exist. Right. It would be easier to sentimentalize Maria than not. Yeah. But he is clever and good enough at what he does to not. Yeah. He gives Maria the dignity of making her a real character, mm -hmm. not some fantasy. Right. That she even, and because even women do it with Jane Eyre, we see it. Oh, yeah. It's not just a male gaze problem. No. <laughs> <laughs> so... The old general is perfectly observed to all his oh, scenes. Kutuzov. Yeah, no, not we're not. We'll, we can talk about Kutsadov, but um, I'm sorry. Oh, the uh, yeah, the yeah. Mister Mister Andre. What what is his name? Mis Count Volkonsky. Volkonsky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a great character. I don't yep. know. I don't know. Have anything more profound to say about him than that? But he's a great character. <laughs> yeah, Com complaining about how terrible women are to his son, who's obviously dissatisfied with the way he gets rid of the Kurigans is pretty great. How does he Vasily really? and Anatoly just? hates them <laughs> so. yeah he's just too old to give a crap about yeah any of these niceties the way he tries to flirt with the french maid <laughs> <laughs> and does it out of spite doesn't he like, oh, yeah because he because yeah. maria dared to like somebody right so he was gonna <laughs> it's like i'll marry her yeah. that'll show you yeah <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, Kutuzov, we should talk about Kutuzov. He really is the other major character in this novel. What do you guys think about, what do you guys think about Kutuzov? What do you think about the war sections in general? What do you want to say about all that? I love the war sections and I love Kutuzov. And I think there's a lot to say about his leadership style. So you would essentially agree with the commentary that Tolstoy is making. I find Tolstoy's commentary very, very compelling. As somebody, I mean, I guess as a student of history, as somebody that grew up with a dad who loves his Civil War and Revolutionary War mm -hmm. and World War II documentaries and stuff like that, I think Tolstoy's perspective is really perceptive and accurate. And what is the, if you had to sum it all up, what is the thing that Tolstoy gets? Tolstoy understands that the dynamics of warfare and these sorts of things are so much more complicated than geniuses sitting in a room executing their strategies and taking in the right suggestions and knowing how it all plays out and, you know, making their calculations. And he understands the human dynamic of the messiness of, of war, the spirit of the troops, what losing discipline does. Mm. And so, you know, you have Napoleon, who's just sort of riding a wave, and you've got Kutuzov, who realizes we're all just riding wave, and what I have to do is just manage the waves and be sure that the right people are in the right places. And the best I can do is put the right people, the best people in the best places, because it's all pretty crazy, and it's all going to play out the way it's going to play out. But if I have the best people in the best places and I'm focused on cultivating the spirit of the troops and just kind of keeping us from, then that's it. That's all I can do. That's not a very good summary, I guess, but... It is when it, you put it in contrast with the great genius theory of one guy comes up with a better idea than the other guy. Yeah. And then that changes the course of human events. Yeah. Well, you know, Tolstoy's forever... He hates historians. Yeah. He really hates historians. Historians and doctors. Historians and doctors. That's right. Yeah. Doctors exist to make you feel like you've done everything you can or are doing everything you can. And otherwise, they just sort of hack around. And if you're lucky, you don't die of the treatments that they, the hack treatments they give you and you heal despite them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> there's a lot of truth about that, at least the state of medicine at his time, which isn't to say that. Medicine hasn't built on that, you know, and become pretty effective, but yeah. just the same. It's pretty funny. But, but yeah, his perspective on, uh, on historians, I think, is just really right. You, and he goes through, and he, in the epilogue, he talks about the different theories. And one of my favorite parts of the epilogue were, was this page. I'll read a little bit of it just to give it a taste, and you can cut it if you want to. Modern history says so he's talking about like how does you know 
The question is, why does it happen? What happened? How did it all happen? And modern history's answer to that is this. Well, Louis XIV was a very proud and presumptuous man. He had such and such mistresses and such and such ministers, and he ruled France badly. Louis' heirs were also weak men and also ruled France badly. They too had such and such favorites and such and such mistresses. Besides, certain men were writing books at that time. At the end of the 18th century, some two dozen men got together in Paris and started talking about all men being equal and free. That led people all over France to start slaughtering and drowning each other. These people killed the king and many others. At the same time, there was in France a man of genius, Napoleon. He defeated everybody everywhere. That is, he killed a lot of people because he was a man of great genius. And he went off for some reason to kill Africans, and he killed them so well and was so cunning and clever that on coming back to France, he ordered everybody to obey him. And everybody obeyed him. Having become emperor, he again went to kill people in Italy, Austria, and Prussia, and there he killed a lot. In Russia, there was the Emperor Alexander who decided to restore order in Europe and therefore made war with Napoleon. But in the year 7, he suddenly made friends with him. Then in the year 11, quarreled again, and again they started killing a lot of people. And Napoleon brought 600,000 men to Russia and captured Moscow. Then he suddenly ran away from Moscow, and the Emperor Alexander, helped by the advice of Stein and others, united Europe to take up arms against the disturber of its peace. All Napoleon's allies suddenly became his enemies. And this armed force marched against Napoleon and had gathered and had gathered new forces. The Allies defeated Napoleon, entered Paris, made Napoleon abdicate, and exiled him to the island of Elba, not depriving him of the dignity of emperor and showing him every respect, though five years earlier and one year later, everybody considered him a bandit and an outlaw. And so began the reign of Louis the Eighteenth, whom, until then, both the French and the Allies had only laughed at. Napoleon, pouring out tears before his old guard, abdicated and went into exile. Then, skillful statesmen and diplomats, in, particu- in particular Talleyrand, who managed to sit in a certain chair before anyone else and thereby extended the borders of France, talked in Vienna. And with these talks made people happy or unhappy. Suddenly, the diplomats and monarchs nearly quarreled. They were already prepared to order troops to kill each other again, but at that moment, Napoleon arrived in France with the battalion, and the French, who hated him, all submitted to him at once. But the Allied monarchs were angered by that, and then again went to war with the French. And the genius Napoleon was defeated and taken to the island of St. Helena, having suddenly become recognized as a bandit. And there the exiles, separated from those dear to his heart and from his beloved France, died a slow death on the rock and bequeathed his great deeds to posterity. But in Europe, there was the reaction, and the sovereigns all started mistreating their own people again. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's pretty funny. So maybe I shouldn't have read that whole thing because... It, it won't play on on the air, but you know he's just like some good satire. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's like, yeah. oh, was it because people wrote books? Oh, was it because twelve yeah. men got in a room? Was it mm-hmm. because somebody sat in a chair? Was it because was he a man of great genius or wasn't he? You know, like or was he abandoned? Yeah, <laughs> which was it, people? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I or think, was it the spirit of the Russian people? What I just keep thinking about is this really applies to every sphere of life, and I think Tolstoy has great wisdom about. Oh, just the little butterflies affects anything that we do. You yeah. know, I mean, I'm thinking about podcasting, right? Some of it has to do with my preparation as the host and the interviewer. Some of it has to do with what Brandon had for lunch. Some of it has to do with what time of what, day. What Jake didn't have for what lunch. What Jake didn't have for lunch, yeah. as the case may be. Yeah. There's just a million factors. And yes, some of it's personality. Some of it's who we are. But some of it's just like... Do we have indigestion that day? Yeah, some of it's just so indefinable, so small that you can't even really account for it or prepare for it. <laughs> you can only, like Jake was saying, kind of ride the waves and make sure the right people are in the right places at the right times. Things get put into motion and mm-hmm. you have to recognize at a certain point there's no real stopping it. It's only just... The greatest podcast ever recorded. Doing yeah. the best with what we've been given. Yeah. Making the next right choice, as Frozen 2, I believe, taught us. And doing so, the next right so things. much more profound than Tolkien. Tolkien. Yeah. 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 Frozen two. Why don't we just do that instead? Yeah. Probably should have. Lord of the Rings, more like bored of the Let's announce it right rings. now. Instead of doing Lord of the Rings, we're doing Frozen. Oh yeah. And Frozen two. Thanks for the money, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Let it go. Get us to two thousand and we get those Lord of the Rings episodes. <laughs> <laughs> that that'd be pretty slimy. <laughs> well, I don't know, guys. Is there anything else you want to say about war and peace? We've gone for a long time now it's great inexhaustible novel i'm sure we could do many more yes, episodes what we thought about the war yeah yeah yeah, scenes. yeah of course people like so one of the things i the one of the stories of a professor that made me so angry was i had this professor once so i went in and she was reading anna karenina and i said oh did you like you like it and she said well she was only going to read the anna parts for with her book club because they decided that loving and kitty parts were boring 
And so you hear the same thing about this book, is that a lot of people only read the peace parts because they find the war parts so boring. But when I went back and read it this time, the war parts and the peace parts, they both speak to one another. And the war parts, there's a lot that's going on in the war parts that are very similar to the peace parts. And I mean, yeah, there's maybe what one one thousandth of the book that's actually battle. Mm-hmm. And those battle scenes, they still They're tell you- They're actually pretty good. Yeah. yeah, they tell you a lot about those characters and how they react. So, like, if you ever wanted to really know how absent-minded and goofy Pierre is, read when he goes into battle. <laughs> he finds himself in the middle wearing of his <laughs> stupid white hat <laughs> and the bloodiest battle. Of all he time. just finds himself useless. <laughs> do, do, do. And he's sort of he's like, like a cartoon oh. character. Like, this he, is happening. He's sitting on like the the hottest point of the whole battle. <laughs> yeah, he's just sort of like <laughs> just observing and, it. Yeah, and he's like, like, eat, yeah, he's like eating cheese and crackers or something. He's just like, oh, this is interesting. <laughs> And then finally somebody dies next to him and like gets splattered with blood and is like, oh, okay, this is real. Wait a minute. (laughs) Wait a (laughs) second. This is real. (laughs) Good old Pierre. (laughs) So yeah, I found, a. I guess, I found a greater unity between the war and peace parts than I Mm -hmm. had in the past. Just this read, I realized that you can't really separate them. They go together. I I love the war parts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I love the peace parts too. They all, they're, they're of one fabric. Yes. So. The, uh, the only time that I even remotely got bored with the war parts was part two of the epilogue. Yes. Where mm-hmm. it basically just turns into his essay. Yeah. But that's what I just read from. Yeah. So, which is hilarious. Yeah. There are bits of that that are even worth it. So, yeah. I mean, it as an worth- essay, I, I'd read the essay. It's a good essay. It's just kind of a weird way to end a novel, Tolstoy. But then again, it wasn't a novel, was not Brandon? It's a weird way to end. <laughs> weird way to end a narrative, a long work of narrative fiction that functions right. exactly like hey, a novel. Talk about, uh, <laughs> we asked our listeners <laughs> if they had a, uh, we asked our listeners if there was anything that fit into the genre and we did get one. Yes. And actually a very good response. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. One may, response. And I think well, maybe we should read it. Okay. I've it's read, not even all, all available in English yet. Is yeah. It? They're still translating it. So it's the red circle Cy- or the red cycle. The Forget the overarching name of it, but August 1914, it's Solzhenitsyn's work on. It's another Russian. Yeah. Who he kind of took up Tolstoy's banner here. Because if you're going to try and be the next great Russian writer, you go to the natural forerunner. The Red mm-hmm. Wheel. The Red Wheel, that's it. The yeah. Red Wheel cycle. And then, it, am I right in understanding that he made Tolstoy one of his characters? Yeah, he meets Tolstoy in here. And also, that's fun. Yeah, you have other famous historical characters, but then some fiction that gets mixed in with it. So it tries to do what Tolstoy was doing with War and Peace <laughs> with the early stages of communism and the communist rule. So Maybe we'll give it a go one day. We're Solzhenitsyn's just... great. I would I would say that he and Tolstoy are the two great Russian writers. Hmm. One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich is pretty wonderful. I think I like him better. You know, that's the one Solzhenitsyn that I've really tried to read. Yeah. And I got, I think it might have just been the place in life that I was in but I was so depressed by it, I just gave it up because I couldn't handle. I, I too have been depressed and given up on Solzhenitsyn before. It's depressing, but it's also really, there's some hope to it as well. Mm-hmm. There's some sweet, like in the trenches beauty to it that you can find beauty even within the goo. I think that's kind of what he's going. Well, I remember, I have some pretty vivid images still from what I did read of yeah. A Day in the Life. Yeah, well, it's been a while since I've read Souls and Instance, so it'll be interesting to see if I still have that. Maybe next year, since we're doing Dostoevsky this year. Yeah, just keep yeah. piling on those. We'll be visiting so all the, the Russians. We'll have to do Turgenev, too, then. We gotta do Turgenev, we gotta do... Uh, Pushkin. Uh, Pushkin, we gotta do Gogol, we, we gotta do all kinds of stuff. Yeah. We haven't done any Kafka yet, he's not Russian, but he certainly fits in that. Have we not do, done any Kafka? Maybe we'll do some Kafka for our horror week thing. Where we read the scary story. You know what I've decided to do, by the way? After all you guys is grousing about how those stories weren't scary and were old and stupid and stuff, or whatever it was you guys groused about. And that I was probably it. And That's I didn't grouse about it anything. It had nothing to do with the fact that they were just bad. Yeah. <laughs> bad. I've decided I am going to go all out. Murder us? <laughs> yes. I'm going to kill both of you guys. <laughs> it was the only way I could think of to get proportional to revenge. Horrify us. <laughs> <laughs> no. I am going to not go for classics of the genre or anything like that. I am just going to try and go for five stories that I personally think are really effective. So this will just be our ways to judge you. Yeah, sure. Okay. (laughs) I like this. It's not going to be like, Young Goodman Brown is something that everyone should read. It's going to be like, I this one's going to get you. This one's going to get you. It's like it's like when you make, made us read The Big Sleep. <laughs> yeah, it's like when I made you read The, read the Big Sleep. That worked out well for everybody. <laughs> that <went> so well. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, 
Speaking of big sleep, people are probably going to fall asleep if we don't end this podcast. Can I, has this been a warm piece size episode? Go ahead. This is not by any length our longest episode, but Jake, go ahead. Yes. I, I want to apologize to our readers for stacking Tolstoy and Austin. Stacking them like, what do you mean? I just don't, I just think it's unfair to Austin to read her right after Tolstoy. Oh, yeah, that's probably true. I think I think any cal any palate cleanser would have set me up to really love and enjoy Sense and Sensibility more instead of having to constantly instead of constantly and naturally comparing it to Tolstoy. And it just doesn't do any favors to anybody who comes after Tolstoy. But if we're talking about the second greatest novelist of all time in Austin, and yeah, I think a palate cleanser would have been yeah helpful for everybody. Something that's not striving for the same kind of... Social observation. Yeah, social observation, relational realism, you know. She's uh, she's amazing, tremendous. She also should have done that. doesn't... She's not Tolstoy. No, she's not. Yeah, well, our listeners will get a little palate cleanser because we're going to come back with some Tolstoy next. Or Tolkien. <laughs> we're going to come back with more Tolstoy. That'll cleanse your palates. <laughs> <laughs> maggots your, <laughs> your palate's overwhelmed by the ice cream here's more ice cream right you're gonna smoke the whole pack <laughs> uh our listeners will get i think two episodes of tolkien and hopefully i won't call him J.R.R. tolstoy the whole time then i wish that it was just tolstoy <laughs> <laughs> yeah can you imagine if tolstoy wrote the lord of the ring oh that would be awesome <laughs> <laughs> do you guys want to say anything else about war and peace last chance Man, Nathan, I could spend a whole other episode, but I'm not. Yeah, there's a lot to say about this one. Brendan, how many... How many what? How many Muzaks out of uh-huh. 45 okay. do you want to give War and Peace? <sighs> Man, I don't know. It's a really hard one for me, Nathan. Oh, I'm leaning towards like 42. 42? I'm back at a few Muzaks, huh? I think I'm going to say 45. <laughs> You're going to go with 45 Muzaks? Yeah. Jake? How many Muzaks out of 45 do you give? Uh Uh-oh. Brandon went with 45. I Mm -hmm. went with 45. I'm going to go with 36. Whoa, he outdid me, Nathan. (laughs) There's only one thing you could do. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to go with zero Muzaks. I hated this book. (laughs) (laughs) Worst book ever? Yeah. (laughs) More like worst and (laughs) peace. (laughs) Piece of crap. (laughs) Worst and piece of crap. (laughs) Fun game on point. Maybe. Yep, fun game on point. More like po- told doy. <laughs> I wonder if we've already said that before. That sounds like something we might have said. All right, guys, let's shout out our donors real quick because you know how they like to be shouted out at the end of a long podcast. So we're leaving yours at zero? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm going to zero music. You know what, Brandon? I'm just not sure I believe in the Muzak system of rating. No, of course, folks, it's 45 Muzaks. <laughs> So Jake just loved it the most. Yeah, Jake loved it far and away the most. Yep. I mean, I could dock it a Muzak. Just to make it interesting, I'll dock it a Muzak. And it comes out to an even perfect score. Right. I'll dock it a Muzak for Tolstoy ultimately not being able to have an all-encapsulating philosophy that actually makes sense to a man of God. Yeah. Unlike every other author, though. (laughs) Yeah. Unlike every other. Against the standard of absolute perfection. (laughs) I think this is like a 44 out of 45. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Nathan, is... why were we so hard on C.S. Lewis and yet not so hard on Tolstoy? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even want to get into that. Guys, where does this rank, having to had a little more time to sit on it, where does this rank as far as <sighs> booketing novels? We said Anna Kay, this, and Pride and Prejudice were kind of Yeah, I'm going to give it a tie. Ones. I'm going to give it a tie with Anna Kay. That's where it sits for me. So it's just pure... Tolstoy's the man for Brandon. Yeah. Jake? It's number two to Anna Karenina. I might put it third of the three, but that's a big Brandon. lineup. I, w- I might say Anna Kay and then Pride and Prejudice. And the reason Pride and Prejudice gets a few extra points is because I'd probably be more inclined to pick that up and read it on a rainy day. Yeah. Then, although maybe not, because you could just read a chapter of Tolstoy and it's self-contained and awesome. There might be some nostalgia in there. Yeah, and there's nostalgia. And... Fair enough. Uh, oh, gosh. I don't know. Whatever. Just for fun, I'll say Anna Kay, Pride and Prejudice, and War and Peace. But they're still the three best books that we've ever read. So Yeah. Okay, guys. Let's say, let's rank our <laughs> patrons. Oh, no. What? <laughs> uh, let's give them Muzak ratings. Okay. So, out of 45. How many Are Muzak's mu- good or bad? I don't. 
They're good. The perfect person gets like Gandhi gets or Brother Teresa. They get forty five out Isn't of forty five. Isn't that just a way to our patrons? Negative music. Oh, well, Jake hates peace and happiness. Um, that's not true. Gandhi gets a lot of. Mother Teresa gets a ton of Muzaks. Hitler gets like zero Muzaks. He gets so zero. That's like the scale we're on here. So Robert and Rhonda the Lovebirds. You guys just shout out the Muzaks. Muzaks you think they should get? One hundred and seventeen. The artful Anthony Dodger. A hundred. A hundred. Little 17. Anthony Cigar Store. A hundred. A hundred and seventeen. <laughs> the Immortal Chelsea E. A hundred. A hundred and seventeen. Jimmy Beam and Little Annie Oakley. A hundred and seventeen. <laughs> Lily of the Valley. A hundred and seventeen. I hope one of these is just like zero. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew and Esther the Lovebirds. A hundred. and seventeen. The Keith Master. A hundred. A hundred and seventeen. David's Many Men Trucking. A hundred and seventeen. John and Jill and Little Baby Max. Jane and Katie who are cold and love cheese and also C.S. Lewis including Till We Have Faces. Fairy Princess of Wonder and Happiness Mother Beth. Three. Console Prime Adam. <laughs> Jeremy the Dark Hooded Lord of Death. Zero. 100. <laughs> <laughs> Nathan, not me. 117. Uh, Maya! 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 100. 117. <laughs> Ryan the Red Avenger and Judith of the Ladies of Justice. 100. 117. Danny the Dude. 117. DJ Sammy G. 117. Benny and Danny Tiberius. 117. Eric and Catherine from Yon Window Breaks. 117. Little Professor and LEDX. Yeah, 117. Lavender's Green, Dylan Dylan. Lavender's Blue. Lavender's Green, Dylan Dylan. I love you too. No Constrictor. 100. 117. <laughs> Cheap. 117. The Fair and Fragrant Moon and Chloe. Six by Zach with me and attacking Captain of the Knack laying down the smack. And then he was cold and hate the life, liberty, and the pursuit of cheese. Jeffy the Texas Ranger. Rachel. 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 Leopard Tank Thomas. 100. Midnight Ninja Ellen. Queen Congetta. 100. Return of the Jedediah. 117. Jay of Rack and Ruin. 17 plus 100. Timothy the Rider at Dawn. 100. Eric and Kate the Camp Champ Kings who are warm and love bees. <laughs> when did we do that? <laughs> I think that was last episode. I oh, don't know. it sounds like last episode. <laughs> uh, we, we, we love Eric and Kate, the camp champ kings who are warm and love bees. <laughs> <laughs> you know why? I think it's because there it's another it's an Eric and Kate that don't live next to Jay. I don't know. I don't know, but they're the Camp Champ Kings who are warm and love bees. And guys, a warm booking welcome. Uh oh. And we need to come up with a new name for Matt. Matt. Matt King Cole, Matt, Matt King Cole. Fresh, Matty Fresh, Matty Fresh, Matt Man, <laughs> Matt Man <laughs> returns. Sing the Batman theme song. Matty, Matty, Matty. Oh, I like that. Matty, 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 Matt Man. Matty, Matty, Matty. All right, Matt, you are in luck, my friend. <laughs> and so are listeners everywhere. Matt Man, <laughs> Matt Man. <laughs> Pow. <laughs> All right, well. Guys, I hope you enjoyed our War and Peace episodes. Listener, if you're out there, I want to strongly encourage you to read Tolstoy. Read this. If you want something a little bit more linear with a little, a few less digressions, then start with Anna K. But either way, do yourself a favor and read Tolstoy. If I could wave my wand and make you as a listener read one book that we have talked about on this podcast, it would either be Tolstoy or maybe Jane Austen. Now, the business of finishing the podcast. If people want to be a patron, they should go to patreon.com forward slash the booking, right, Jake? That's right. And what do they do when they're there? Well, if you give, I don't know, say the price of a cup of coffee each month, you get access to our behind the scenes videos. For 10 bucks a month, you get a an awesome donor shout out. Much like Matt Man. For $25 a month, you get our now annual t-shirt. Mm-hmm. And for $50 a month, you get... All of the books that we do on the booking signed, personalized, and sent to your door well in time for you to read them uh, prior to our episodes. He's not lying, folks. And we send quality copies. <laughs> we do. We do. And people- You get your money's worth, I dare say. Breaking news. Yes. <sighs> Noel Coward is now the most liked post <laughs> on the Bookening's Instagram. That is- 82 likes. <laughs> Too bad. It is going to keep going to. I bet this might be our first post to get 100 likes. <laughs> no coward of all I think so. <laughs> Just looking at the rate that this, you only posted this because the rate of likes is not going to start dying down for 24 hours, I bet. Wow. And you posted this 16 hours ago. Well, folks, there you go. We got a lot of <laughs> coward heads. I don't know <laughs> why. <laughs> Most of my efforts have <laughs> failed to get this many likes. 
but this is what the people apparently are asking for. People just love Noel Coward, you know? Yeah. It's just it's one of those things. Apparently. Death, taxes, and Noel Coward are the three taxes. inevitable things about life. And Noel Coward. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody.